Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Over the month of August, we are looking at a series called The End of Me, based on a book that is written by Kyle Eidelman. And this sermon that I'm preaching today is, is based around a chapter that he wrote. And we're going through this sermon on the mount and unpacking some of the counterintuitive truths that brokenness is the way to wholeness. That mourning is the path to blessings and emptiness is required in order to discover true fulfilment. Ultimately, we will discover how Jesus transforms us as we begin to live out these paradoxical principles. Only when we come to the end of yourself can you begin to experience the full, the blessed, the whole life that Jesus wants to offer. Some of us have written, have read some of Ernest Hemingway's uh, writings. He's a well-known author. But this guy once made a bet. It was with a group of all authors over lunch and has since become a story. Now the guys bet him $10 if he couldn't come up with a short story with only six words. Now I'm thinking of some of the uh, bets that uh, some of us have, might have had over the years, you know, when tradies get together, what do are, what are they bet about? What do um, architects bet about when they get together and so on? What do pastors uh, bet when they get together? I bet you can't preach under 45 minutes. I don't know what, what pastors would, would preach about. Anyway, Hemingway took that bet. He pulled out a napkin and wrote the following story on it. For sale, baby shoes never worn. Hemingway understood the power of words, even just a few words, which was actually the essence of his style. And what he wrote was powerful six words of a very sad story. If you were to write a story that had or has an impact on your life, what would those words be? There's been a terrible accident. I'm leaving. The marriage is over. Your position is no longer needed. I just want to be friends. The cancer isn't responding to treatment. Here's a rose of the casket. These six words all contain a powerful story that describes something very sad. But what if things were, were different? What if you could reverse the outcome? What if your mourning could lead to blessing? Jesus makes another kingdom in reverse kind of statement here. Last week, when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, he begins to introduce us to the great kingdom paradox. At the end of me, at the end of my rope, I can find real life in him. And so in the midst of loss and disappointment, when it feels like we're coming to the end of our rope, Jesus turns the page and shows us a new story of hope and redemption. As he continues that sermon, preach on a mountain near the Sea of Galilee. Jesus shows us another way of life that can look different through his kingdom lenses. 
Let's look at a little bit more of this context of this sermon in Matthew 5 to chapter 7. Matthew let us know that there was a large crowd that came to hear Jesus preach. In verse 2 where Matthew said that he opened, that Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, that it has a very deep meaning. Last week I looked at this just briefly. In the Greek language this phrase opened his mouth means that what Jesus shared was very important to him and was coming from his heart. Matthew wanted us to know that what Jesus taught on the mountainside was very much on his heart. And so over this month of August we are exploring what was on Jesus' heart and what he wanted us to know. And so Jesus launched into his sermon with a list of very striking paradoxes. For our purposes, we're going to be looking at four of these statements that sound ridiculous to us at first, but start to make sense once you think a little deeper and compare with your own personal experiences. And so last week we looked at how, how the poor in spirit are, are blessed. That is when... When those people, when those of us who, when we are down to, to nothing, when we're at the end of our rope, and while they have been clean to their rope all of their, their lives, and all of a sudden they've come to the end of their rope, it's then that they are poor in spirit. They have nothing link, left to cling to, and yet Jesus says that they are blessed if they learn to then cling on to the almighty God. For theirs is the kingdom of God, meaning that God is allowed to reign in and through their lives. Jesus then goes on to the next beatitude. Blessed are, blessed are. What will it be? Based on how the world thinks in our own experiences, how would you complete this sentence? Blessed are those who get great jobs, those of us who get beautiful houses, when you get something else great happen to you. I mean, let's face it, many of us, I have used the statement, oh, we're just so blessed in reference to going on a lovely holiday or getting a new car or, or a new job. How blessed I am. Nothing wrong with that. But here, here's how Jesus finishes the statement. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Those who mourn, sitting down in that first century crowd, with the first century crowd on that mountainside, here amongst all these people, where they lived in an age where there was so much infant mortality, a short lifespan of hunger, of disease, of national humiliation. And he says those words, those who mourn. It would have made up a major portion of, of the crowd that he was speaking to. So then what, what was Jesus thinking about when he uses the word mourning? The Bible offers us a few examples to help us understand. First, we mourn the hard circumstances of life. The commentator William Barclay says about this word, the Greek word for to mourn used here is the strongest word for mourning in the Greek language. It is defined as the kind of grief which takes such a hold that it cannot be hidden. It is not only the sorrow which brings an ache to the heart, it is the sorrow which brings the unrestrainable tears to our eyes. And so we think, okay, that's okay, we can understand what he's talking about here, but where is the blessing in this? I think this is one of the, those areas where 21st century Western culture has influenced most of us. For most, we would say something like, we are so blessed when things are 
going so well. We are blessed when we get into our chosen course. We have a blessed life as any normal person would define it, would be a life free from mourning, not marked by it. Jesus says that when we mourn, when life gets extremely difficult, when we experience the deepest of suffering we have ever encountered, when we've come to the end of the rope, then we are blessed. It seems upside down. But maybe the problem is that we've spent so much of our lives looking at something upside down that it seems right side up to us. In surprising ways, suffering makes room in our spirit for us to know and experience the blessing of God's peace and presence. Without suffering, we simply can't know his comfort. In mourning, we experience the blessings of God's presence. In the Old Testament book, Job, Satan was looking forward to Job and his suffering. Job was experiencing them, what most of us would call quite a blessed life. I mean, he was rich, happily married, living the good life, but storms, particularly nasty storms, were coming his way. Satan thought that once this bad stuff came, Job would hold it against God and he would declare that his religion is invalid and useless. The first chapter of Job tells us how he, how he had seven sons and three daughters, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen and 500 donkeys, not to mention uh, a small army of servants. Then Job became a kind of case study of faith in suffering because he lost nearly everything bit by bit. I mean, a strong wind came and knocked down his house and killed his children. But the book of Job was just getting started. In the second chapter, Job lost his health. He was infested with sores on every inch of his body. He lost all of his um, his uh, livestock, he lost all of his wealth and Satan was betting on him of losing his faith too. His wife's best advice was curse God and die. To Satan's bewilderment, Job experienced God in a way that he had never had before. In chapter 42, verse 5, he said, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. Here's what we find in our suffering. There is a deep void that used to be filled with whatever we lost. That could be stuff or, or even relationships, none of which are bad things. But when it's gone, it leaves an aching cavity. And God is there to fill it up with himself. When we suffer, we mourn. And when we mourn, we are comforted by the God of all comforts. Blessed are those who mourn. Everyone experiences loss and no one is overjoyed by it. Black is black, except when it isn't. Let's write another six-word story. God will not waste your pain. Here's another one. God will never leave you alone. Eugene Peterson's The Message paraphrases Matthew 5 verse 4 this way you're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you when you're at the end of your rope 
you have the opportunity to experience the very presence of God in a way like never before. Maybe you've embraced some wonderful things and lost them. But there's no embrace like the divine embrace. Jesus isn't recommending that you take up suffering as a weekend hobby. He just wants you to realise that you can find an incredible blessing hidden in the shadows and in the valleys. And that blessing might be visible only through the lenses of your tears. When disaster comes, we can't see anything bigger than what we've lost. But the truth is, God more than fills that space. We begin to see that he's not just filling that space, but spaces that we didn't even know that we had. Everyone experiences loss. Everyone mourns. But those who follow Jesus find that their pain is not wasted. There is a blessing that seems totally illogical. It requires climbing to the bottom of the deepest of pits without a flashlight, venturing far out into the darkness. But the blessing is there and it's worth everything. The Bible speaks about another form of mourning. There is also the mourning that is in response to sin in ourselves and around the world. This sinfulness wreaks havoc on us, on those we love, on relationships, on the world around us. Through scripture there is a connection between mourning over sin of every kind but also of receiving God's blessing. Israel often mourned together as a nation and received God's blessing as a nation. There's an intriguing example of this kind of mourning in the Old Testament. David, you may remember, had that affair with Bathsheba. In time, the magnitude of his sin came crushing down on him and he was in utter distress and distraught and brought him undone. He mourned from the depths of his soul. In Psalm 32, turn with me to Psalm 32, he talks about the period of time before he took on that mourning. On the surface, he actually would have appeared happier. Denial often puts on a happier face. But at the soul level, it was a different story. He was missing out on the life-changing, faith-altering blessing that comes from God. Look at verses 1 and 2, Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and in whose spirit is no deceit. The word blessed is used twice in these two sentences. But that's not the only word. Sin is also mentioned twice in these two verses. Sin is an interesting word. A century or so ago, our English vocabulary was rich in the cinnamons of... Cinnamon? Sin, you know what I mean? Cinnamon? Not the ones that you <laughs> pour on your things. Anyway, words like iniquity, transgression, depravity. New Testament Greek had 33 different words for sin. Among some of my colleagues, preachers, we don't tend to speak much about sin, perhaps not even use that word. If we do, perhaps we might just water it down a little bit so it doesn't kind of offend. We may be able to wipe sin from our sermons but we can't wipe it out of our souls. As a culture, we can try to rub out the definition of sin, but the condition 
isn't going anywhere. If we fail to acknowledge sin's reality, there can be no mourning. And without mourning, there can be no confession. And without confession, we can miss the richest blessings of God's forgiveness and grace that can be found in Jesus Christ. Without seeing the depths of sin, we will never understand the height of God's love and grace. In Psalm 32, David goes on to say, verses 3 and to 5, When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Have you ever experienced the blessing of facing up to sin? It's amazingly liberating. We put so much energy into running away, hiding, pretending somebody else has done it. Or that hole we dug wasn't really that deep. Sooner or later, we stop running. Usually because we've usually because we've run out of places to run to. We finally let the tears come. And that's when we find the missing strength. The twist is that it's not our strength at all. It's the power of God's arms wrapped around us. And when I'm at the end of my rope, I find the richest of blessings. So let's be clear. We will all fall into sin. Romans teach us, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. Everyone does. And you'll still be slow to face your mourning. Everyone is. Just understand that in your hesitancy to mourn your sin, you're also delaying the blessings of God. There is no way to get to that blessing without the mourning that precedes it. David has told us about sin, about confession, about the wonderfulness of God's forgiveness and righteousness. And then he disrupts the whole discussion like this. He says, Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. (coughs) Mourning isn't a no big deal kind of thing. It isn't an okay if you're into that sort of thing. It isn't a think positively and it will go away sort of thing. It's a necessary thing and it's a very beneficial thing, a blessing thing. And James' advice to us is this, James 4 verses 8 to 10. Come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up, it says. Since repentance and mourning don't come naturally to us, let me offer some questions to ask yourself to start you on this path that leads to blessing. How have I sinned in the last few days? Who else have been hurt by my sin? Besides confessing to God, is there someone I need to apologise to? How can I clean up my mess my sin has made? Whom will I confess my sins to? What excuses and justification Have I just come up with answering these questions? The Old Testament had a compelling tradition which we should perhaps have a little bit more closer look at. One is called penitential, penitential mourning. It was usually a period of seven perhaps to 30 days. And it was a time for the whole community 
to grieve together over its sin. People sometimes wore sackcloth as an outer expression of their inner mourning to visually communicate that they were at the end of their rope. Perhaps some of us need a penitential mourning, perhaps lasting for days, instead of putting on our happy faces. Perhaps you need to let tears come. Back in the 1600s, the Puritan Tom, Thomas Watson said it this way, Tears mount God's heart and bind his hand. It's a far cry from have a nice day faith that sometimes people like me can preach. I realise that. It is not a rah-rah kind of sermon, is it? But it happens to be aligned with truth. And it happens to be one path to the deepest, fullest joy that God can offer. You'll walk through the valley of the shadow. But I promise you this. You will never walk alone. The blessing awaits. Father God, we just heard a, a sermon that, that perhaps for some of us is hard to hear. Perhaps it ought to disturb each one of us as it did for me. First of all, Lord, I want to pray for those who are going through some hardships, Lord. Whether they've caused it or whether other people have caused it, Lord. Whatever reason, Lord, they're going through some hard, hard times. That's life. And I just pray, Father God, that you will be with them, Lord. And I just pray, God, that in their mourning, in their mourning, would you help them to experience your comfort. You said that you are the God of all comfort, so please come and comfort them. You know, Lord, in some of the deep valleys that they are experiencing. For some people, they've been experiencing those valleys for a very long time, and they're sick of it. And I just pray, God, that you'll come and minister to them by the power of your Holy Spirit with your loving arms surrounding them, comforting them, giving them hope. May they experience how they can be blessed through this very difficult period that they are experiencing. For each of us, Lord, who sin, we are truly, truly, truly sorry. And I pray that you help us to wake up to the seriousness of sin, but also to the greatness of your love and grace. And I pray, Father God, that you help us to come before you with a great sense of sadness and sorrow in, in our hearts for the sin that we have caused. And I pray, Father God, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, that you help us to overcome and to experience your blessed life in its all its fullness. Thank you for the examples of people like David and Job who were far from perfect, but people who come before you, who came before you, and they experienced you in a, such a special way. So Father God, I pray that you help us as a church collectively to walk in step with your Holy Spirit, to be empowered by your word so that we together may just see the wonders of your love and grace. Thanks for being with us here this morning. And afterwards, Lord, may our fellowship be warm and authentic. May we enjoy each other's company. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.